Hi, I'm Tim and welcome to Watch You Want. Thanks for logging on. Today, we're looking at a watch that embodies a period of transition for Rolex. Now, the late 1970s, early 1980s were traumatic times for the Swiss watch industry generally. But what Rolex managed to do was sidestep the decline of the quartz era that claimed roughly two-thirds of the Swiss watch industry, including most of its smaller players. Rolex never lost its premium sheen. But what it did experience was a switch from its status as a manufacturer of you know, no holds barred, no excuses made, professional tool watches for British Special Forces, U.S. Navy SEALs, for Comex divers, for those who were hale and hearty and truly taking their timepieces into harm's way, to a purveyor of upscale luxury fashion statements and status symbols. And Rolex really took a few years to bed into comfort with that role. And the period represented one in which the watches were gradually gaining content, gaining features, and changing from that earlier tool watch aesthetic and tool watch specification to something that was decidedly upscale and polished, but perhaps a little bit less romantic. The great thing about this Rolex Oyster Perpetual Submariner 16800 transitional reference is that it kind of embodies the best of both worlds. You get that classical Rolex tool watch look no holds barred utility, no excuses made, but you also get some of the upscale features that we've come to take for granted in Rolex sports models to this day. And that's a great thing because this watch is a usable classic. Hailing from the early 1980s, it's a 7,400,000 serial number range watch. It combines a lot of the everyday usability of a modern Rolex with clear indications that this is a veteran. This is a vintage watch with a gorgeous patina. This is a vintage watch with delicate lugs, with a case that's not overbearing, and a bracelet that wears light and comfortable. Everything about this watch represents something of a best of the old and the new. And first and foremost, you've got to talk about the feel and the look on the wrist, because watches are made to be worn, and Rolexes especially so. 40 millimeters, as is traditional for the Rolex Submariner, it's a light and wieldy 40 millimeters. It sits flat. Now, this is long before the six-digit reference subs and the super case, and you can really feel it. First and foremost, there's a tight taper between the curved lugs and the width of the bracelet. You don't have the gap that you see on the modern oversized case Submariners, so it's got a little bit more elegance to it. It's also a bit flatter, and because the lugs and the crown guards are a bit more pared down compared to the more recent references, there's an elegance to it. Again, there's a purity to it that recalls the classic era of Rolex sports watches of the mid-century. But because we are moving into that early 80s time period, you've also got upscale modern features. Take a look at the clarity of that gorgeous patina dial. It's old school tritium and a great one, but the reason you can see it as clearly as you can is because this was the first Rolex Submariner reference to feature a sapphire crystal, and because of that, there are no scratches or scuffs or marks of age to mar your view of that gorgeous matte finish dial. Now the first, roughly the first, I would say third of 16800 production was with the matte dial with the printed tritium indexes, and this is by far the more desirable of the two variants, the latter being glossy with applied indexes. Collectors favor the old school look, and this one is incredibly original. And the patina is special. Now the thing about patina is, in general, it will form on every watch, but it will not express itself the same way on every watch. There are good patinas, there are worse patinas, there are more dramatic patinas, more and less attractive patinas. And the good news here is this watch, this example I'm wearing on my wrist, has one of the best. You can see that it's nice and even, but it's also a gorgeous, deep, rich ecru color, and it's matched by the original pearl on the bezel. You can see that the pearl itself has patina to the point now, I should mention a lot of these in time are lost, so you wind up with bezels that are bare at the Pearl Station with just a little black hole to mark where it was. Not only is this one still here, but it beautifully complements the dial, the indexes, and the hands. This is the complete package aesthetically. It looks gorgeous on the wrist. It actually feels great because of the slight bracelet, the slight lugs, the slight crown guard, the vintage style case, and it looks just as good, so that's a great tandem. Now, when I talk about vintage features, I'm not just talking about things like the size of the case and the color of the dial. I am, in fact, talking about the weight of the, of the bracelet itself. And this old-style three-link oyster bracelet is very light. It, it basically disappears on your wrist because of that lightness. It's not inclined to pull hairs. It doesn't cramp. 
it doesn't pinch. Everything about the old style of the Rolex bracelet, including that charming Rolex rattle, is present and correct on this example. It has, again, that feeling of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s Rolex Submariners that defined the breed before it became a luxury product. And it's what old schoolers, it's what the Jacques Cousteau type would have liked and would have experienced back in the day. But, as I stated, the modern features were pouring in, and Jacques never would have experienced a Submariner with 300 meter water resistance, because this was the first generation that included the modern 1,000 foot 300 meter depth rating that has defined the Submariner to this day. So you've got that modern water tank integrity, scratch resistant crystal, but you've got the beautiful fit, the wear, the on the wrist impression, and the aesthetic of the vintage watch. In a lot of ways, it's the best of both worlds, the old and the new. And that continues inside, where there's a COSC chronometer certified Rolex 3035 movement. Now during the 1970s, Rolex gained the hacking feature in the Submariner, so you could stop the seconds and set it precisely to a reference time. But with this generation, the transitional reference, you also gain the modern 28.8 beat rate. So that in terms of precision, in terms of precision as a derivative of the rate of the movement, this one is right there with the modern references. It was a COSC Swiss chronometer in the early 1980s, and it remains that kind of performer today because we've tested this watch. In addition to outstanding amplitude, it's also running within COSC specs as tested through all six positions on the chronoscope. So it's a remarkable survivor in every sense, aesthetically and mechanically. It's a phenomenal opportunity to wear something that, as I said, combines many of the best of both worlds. Modern reliability, chronometric performance, watertight integrity, and the aesthetic qualities of the sapphire crystal, but with the importance of all those early first generation, first era Submariner features. Everything from the tritium to the light feel of the bracelet to the light impression of the case on the wrist. It's romantic, it's old school, but it's also substantially very up-to-date and it's a great document that really charts the changing course of Rolex and tells part of the story of that great manufacturer from Geneva. So check out this Rolex Oyster Perpetual Submariner 16800 transitional reference only produced from roughly 1978 to 1987. This is one of the shortest lived generations of Rolex Submariner of all time and because this one is such a survivor with such a gorgeous patina dial you further diminish the pool of real rivals to this watch. There are not many on the market or even in collectors' hands that can compare to the quality of this example. And of course, all the technological and historical features we just reviewed are self-evident. Check it out on our website, Watch You Want.